Hey guys, um, I know that I'm the last piece between you guys and lunch, so I'll keep it quick. So yeah, my name's Van. I want to talk a little about DeFi and how institutions, which are our current set of customers, work with DeFi. A little about Floating Point Group is that we help traditional financial institutions trade, settle, and custody their cryptocurrency. Um, yeah, so without further ado. So yeah, what is DeFi right now? Um, DeFi has grown a large, large, large amount in the past year. Um, in fact, the yields have, uh, sorry, the year-to-date growth has been, you know, 57 billion. Um, and that's a lot more than, um, yeah, that, that's a lot more than I expected when I started uh, Floating Point Group, as well as when you guys probably started um, exploring crypto, right? We're all excited for this, um, yeah, the change that's happening right now. Um, now, with respect to traditional financial institutions, um, they're excited about DeFi, but not for the top right corner. They're not excited for 9,999% yields. They're not excited for, you know, getting the fastest, get, getting the best NFTs. They're not looking to make, you know, $20,000 on an NFT. Um, what they're looking for is something a bit um, less grandiose, but just as important. They just want the ability to beat the current 10-year treasury bond. Right now, that is less than 1%. If we offer, and by we, I mean the DeFi community as a whole, offer something that is a little bit better than 1%, um, in this case, 4.48%, uh, then we're golden. And that's how we can get at least the financial interest of traditional financial institutions on our side. So yeah, um, with respect to how Floating Point Group advises our, um, the institutions that we work with. Um, we generally have a list of blue chip stocks. Um, generally, blue chip stocks has a variety of criteria. Um, they're traded on Coinbase, they're traded on Kraken. Um, the SEC has not explicitly said anything of injury to them. And lastly, um, the contracts are all auditable and that you know, Floating Point Group ourselves have read the details of it in order to um, recommend to our customers in good faith to use these D uh, DeFi products. So yeah, what are these products? Um, I'm sure you guys know all of these products listed here, um, but the one that we will talk a little bit more about, at least with respect to tra TradFi, is borrowing and lending. Um, tr traditional finance, they have a lot of you know, capital, that's why we're so interested in working with them. But um, they're not looking to make, again, the next NFT. They're not looking to do anything better than 5%, which is what a yield aggregator would provide. Um, and in addition, yield aggregators are an issue because they will aggregate a bunch of yields from different protocols. Um, and having more protocols mean more surface areas for attack. So yeah, here is a little landscape of what it what DeFi is and how traditional financial institutions are judging it. Um, the green is what uh, tradi what traditional financial institutions consider safe. The yellow um, is a little bit more risky. These are where hedge funds and asset managers tend to play a part. And the red are um, very adventurous hedge funds. Um, so I don't think you guys are going to be surprised about anything here. We already know that synthetics um, are a really big issue. The SEC, um, Gary Gensler specifically, um, said that you know synthetic stocks are definitely under the purview of the SEC just by virtue of the fact that they're represent they're, they're, they're representation of stocks. Um, but on the top left corner, you have you know just simple cryptocurrencies. Um, this would be where you can imagine the government buying it, some kind of corporate treasury buying it, and yeah, on the diagonal is the space for hedge funds. Um, and in FPG's case, um, our set of customers are hedge funds. So yeah, what are the risks that are involved um, with, with uh, DeFi? Well, the first risk is default risk. Um, I won't go into more detail. I'm pretty sure there's one word that you guys are all familiar with, and the word is rug pull. Um, rug pulling is a big issue for Solana, um, mainly because the code is less readable um, by virtue of the bike, yeah, by virtue of how it compiles. And in addition, there is a lot more, a lot more um, NFTs being minted out 
or being created in Solana just by virtue of the, the, the lower cost inhibitions of, of Solana. Um, the second part is the tech. Um, as I mentioned a little bit, audits are quite important. Audits are, of course, um, a little bit more challenging in Solana by, because it's a different language compared to Ethereum. The auditors that are popular on Ethereum are only slowly moving to Solana right now. And um, yeah, they're getting, they're getting their bearings, but it will be a while until these, the, the auditors for uh, Solana have the methodology to actually move forward with um, a lot of the new projects in Solana. And lastly, um, I want to give a shout out to the Crate project on Solana. It's creating, uh, it's creating a more understandable, uh, basically an API for API specification for uh, auditors to read, for the hedge fund um, engineers to read, for us to read, in order to understand what's actually happening in the hood for Solana. So yeah, this last part, the second part, and uh, is regulation. Um, so regulation has been pretty um, substantial in the past year. Um, AM, I'm sure you guys are familiar with AM, AML, which is anti-money laundering. Um, what that is entails is that we have to make sure that all of the money, most of the money in cryptocurrency is, is you know, clean money. We don't want to be using some of the, you, we don't recommend to our, um, our set of customers to be using Tornado Cash, for instance, because the set of customers that use Tornado Cash are not the set of customers that, um, that, want, that hedge funds want to be involved with. Um, the second thing is that the SEC has been, um, has been tough on, on, on DeFi. Um, the, big, the big issue here has been CeFi lending. Um, originally, tr traditional financial institutions have actually been using the, um, the CeFi lending platforms just because that is a third party solution for them. They didn't have to access DeFi themselves. But now that um, CeFi has been getting into much more trouble, um, hedge funds and whatnot are looking into um, DeFi just directly in order to solve the problems that they want to solve, which is make money. Um, and lastly, the CFTC, luckily, are, is not being very uh, stringent on the regulations of, of crypto. So yeah, go with them. Um, and the last, yeah, and the last thing I want to talk about is for um, yeah, for traditional financial institutions to get into DeFi is transaction monitoring. So as you can see here, this is a, um, a yeah, this is a DeFi platform. Um, I've hidden the name, but you can see that um, the level of severity, even though there's a few high risk and a few mediums, is still considered low risk at the end of the day. Um, so what does it mean to be high risk? Well, it's connected to a high risk exchange. Uh, I won't name any exchanges. Um, you know, uh, there is a, or there could have been a rug pull and the money was sent to said exchange or um, DeFi venue and liquidated, and the proceeds were liquidated there. Um, the TradFi does not want to be a part of that. Um, now, I want to give you another platform. And as you can see, this platform you know, it looks relatively all right if you look right to left, but there's just this one red, big red blip, and that one big red blip, despite the fact that there's less risk indicators, just that one blip has made this, um, the severity of this, uh, this project quite high, and therefore this project is, you know, eliminated from the purview of traditional financial institutions. And lastly, yeah, um, I want to talk about yield aggregators. So the issues with yield aggregators is that they're connected to much, much, much more projects. Um, the, they make money, as, as you guys know, from aggregating the yields of different uh, protocols and you know, yield farming. And the issue with yield farming is that you're moving tokens from one project to a protocol to another, to another, to another. And so what traditional financial institutions have to do is analyze all of the different protocols. So in our case, um, we can see that you know everything is medium to low to high, and you know you can even see that sushi swap considered high. But then this is definitely eliminated because of harvest. Um, harvest is a yeah, harvest is a less popular blockchain. And right now, before we actually move into uh, yeah, I won't speak anymore about harvest. <laughs> and um, yeah, so the future of DeFi 
is that provided that we actually address the concerns of tech auditing as well as you know de increasing the honest participants of DeFi and decreasing um, the the probability as well as the potential for rug pulls, um, we hope to see that you know blue chip stocks or blue chip DeFi can be recommended. Um, as you know, we're um, I'm sure all of us are big fans of Serum, Solanart, Mango, and Sunny. Yeah, so that's it. Um, are there any questions? There's questions. I am here to give you the microphone. I think it's time for lunch then, if there's no questions. Okay. <laughs> so how big is the demand or interest from TradFi and DeFi, what's what's kind of feeling? Yeah, so the, the demand is, for at least from our perspective, and a little bit more about us. Um, we have offices in New York, Singapore. We have an office in the Cayman, um, and we see a lot of demand from everywhere in traditional, whether it be Asia, whether it be the U.S., whether it be Europe. Um, what's stopping them is effectively a green a stamp a green light from from government to actually move in they're happy to move in they're right now due to the covid as well as the stagnation that's happening um they're looking for yields in any way they can and this is one of them um one question Given the kind of lack of flexibility institutional investors have, like they have their mandates, it takes them time to kind of change like the type of investments they can make with the funds they, they manage and so on. Um, what's your feeling or, or your understanding of the situation of the industry in terms of uh, how much institutional players and how much capital is kind of uh, locked, like willing to get into crypto, willing to get into DeFi, but not able because they haven't been able to sort out like all the issues they have to sort out with their limited partners and so on. And yeah. how will it, it play out in the following months, years, and so on? Yeah, so just going back into the matrix. Um, so just to summarize your question a little bit more, it, you're asking what information do you, I have that I can share um, that traditional financial institutions are interested? Um, I will say that a lot, like the green is, you know, lending, borrowing, and staking. I will say that a large, a, a lot of the Ethereum staking is traditional financial institutions. That is a very c clear cut case where traditional financials can just say, hey, we can be a part of this. And that there's no issues with that. And right now, that's how they're generating their yields. Um, now, as for this, market size of Ethereum staking right now, I'm not too sure off the top of my head, but um, it's drastic. The number of stakers are drastically um, favored towards the institutions. We probably have time for one more. Okay. Would you say that um, stable coins are the entry point for institutionals into this field? Um, yeah, that's a great question. So not particular, there, there are two set of, um, of institutions. One that is trying to generate yield and one is that's trying to, uh, gener that, that's just trying to take some risk and, you know, buy Bitcoin and hold Bitcoin for a long time. Um, I've been talking about a lot about the former. Um, there is also cases of the latter as well. Um, you know, MicroStrategy is a great example of the latter. Um, but as for the former, yes, it's, it's mainly doing, um, yeah, it's mainly using stable coins to actually generate yield. Um, stable coins are in a great area for, um, my, my risk matrix doesn't really list stable coins here, but stable coins is definitely in the top left. <laughs> yeah. All right. Great. Thank you so much, Van. Um, that is all. Please give a round of, a, round of applause to Van. Thank you.